Hello, I'm Pierre Corbinet, so I'm here to talk uh, about playful literature. Uh, first of all, my English isn't really good, so please excuse me for the mistakes and stuff like this. And also, uh, talking about uh, literature uh, in 20 minutes isn't easy because I won't have time to read stuff and you won't have time to read stuff. So I made little booklets for you to read uh, after or during the talk, uh, I don't mind. So please pass them on. So here, uh, first of all, uh, I just want to confirm something maybe. Who among you uh, has already took part in a game jam? Who has ever, okay, yeah, clearly most of you, yeah. Um, so I guess uh, most of you will agree with this sentence. Constraints are a source of creativity. Uh, this is nothing new. The, this is something that probably, an idea that probably always has been around. Um, here we can find example of constrained writing in uh, the book of Psalms in the Hebrew Bible. So that's something like eight or seven or eight centuries before common era. era. So for example, in this Psalm 119, every eight verses start with the same letter and it does all the alphabet. So the first eight start with Aleph. Uh, it starts from the Left, starts from left. So eight first start with Aleph, the next eight start with Bet, Aleph, Bet, Aleph, Bet, that Aleph, Bet, that's where the world came from. Um, but the, the one who really, truly embraced this idea of constraints as a form of creativity are probably the members of the, the Ulipo. Oh, the Ulipo is a French uh, literature movement from the 60s. Um, the, their main idea was to explore literature by giving themselves, building themselves constraint, hard constraint. So the, the most famous work of the Eulipo is probably La Disparition de Georges Perec. In English, it's titled A Void. It's a, a, a whole book without the letter E, which is the, by far the most, most used letter in French and in English too. Uh, but they made, uh, they, it's not, it's just, it's only a tiny fraction of what they made. Um, and now you're probably wondering why am I, I'm here in a um, fest, fest, the video game festival in Germany in 2017 talking to you about French literature of the 60s. And well, that's because um, Ulipo has uh, actually a lot to do with games and, and even video games. Uh, they were really interested in puzzles, in, in board games, and even in computers, which were still called um, logical machines back then. We are talking about really early times for computer. And uh, these guys, because yeah, they were mostly guys, uh, created a lot of cle clever things um, that, are now, that are now part of the video, video game world that we now use in video games. And that's what I want to show you. So, interactive fiction. As you might probably know, the first interactive fiction is Colossal Cave Adventure in 1975. And, well, it, it's not. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, interactive fiction is probably Story As You Like It by Raymond Queneau, written in 1967. So here's a short example. You also have the full text in the back of your booklet. Yeah? So yeah, this is a short version. Do you wish to hear the story of the three alert spies? No, okay, go to two. Would you prefer the story of the three big skinny bean poles? No. Would you prefer the story of the three middling mediocre brushes? No. In this case, the story is like well, it's finished. Oh, this is the shortest version. Uh, this is written like a game book, which makes it probably the first game book too, because uh, I think on Wikipedia I saw the first game book was uh, the, the Adventure of You on Sugarcane Island, and it was in 1970, so that's three years before, and this has been ported on computer in 69, so yeah, interactive fiction for real. Uh, procedural generation. Okay, that's something very video gamey, right? Randomness, algorithm. Well, Ulipo did it too. 
Uh, this book is called uh, 100,000 Billion Poems, and it actually features 100,000 billion poems. Uh, it's pretty hard to explain without the picture, but luckily we, we, we've got the picture. So every page is cut into strips, and there's a verse on each strip. So you can open the book randomly and get a new poem, a poem that probably no one has ever seen before. Uh, so you've got random nefts, of course. You've got algorithm. It's the structure of the sonnet. They are, they are the, the poems where are always sonnets. So yeah, that might be the closest thing to, proce uh, to procedural generation you can get uh, on paper. Emergent narrative. The idea of extracting stories from a gameplay. Ulipo did it. Um, this, the book is called, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it in English. Uh, uh, I think this is the belongs to sign in, mathematical, in mathematics. So this book is a um, collection of poem, poems based on a game of Go. Uh, so ev every poem of the book is based on a, a move from this game of Go. So Jacques Roubault really took a game and extracted poetry out of it, extracted stories, and yeah, that, I, I, uh, that, that, that's what I call emergent narrative in a way. Uh, the book is really hard to read, so I wouldn't recommend it, because yeah, Jacques Roubault is a really weird guy, but yeah, it exists, it does exist, and it's great. Uh, puzzle, well, that's probably the most obvious. Uh, Georges Pirec uh, uh, and some other uh, well, all, all the Uli members of the Olipo were really interested in puzzle, but George Pirek uh, especially. George Pirek is one of the most famous members of the Olipo and also le, the most famous uh, French verbicrucist uh, crossword maker. He made a hundred of crosswords, but also designed a lot of new puzzles for magazines and newspaper, making it uh, making him. Um, a uh, really early game designer, in fact. So, uh, do you have the answer for this one? No one? Yeah, why? Uh, you've got another one, another easy one on, on the booklet. Nothing. Okay, uh, what was it supposed to be? What? what? Where am I? I don't know where am I. Okay, that's... <laughs> And at the end, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, there's nothing. Yeah, it was a character selection screen. So this is a character selection screen. This is something, again, looks really video game-ish. Uh, because you can't really select a character in a movie or in a novel. novel. Well, actually, yeah, it, it, oh, it just doesn't work. I lost the, lost the screen. Maybe if I do this, yeah, okay, that's good. So, yeah, you, you can actually select a character in a novel, like in this one, exercises in style. So this book tells a, a very simple story. A guy gets into a bus, sees a weird guy, and sees that weird guy a few hours later elsewhere. That's it, that's the story, boring story. But this story is told uh, in 19 different ways, like if it was told by 19 different people. And it's not like 99 different people were there and tell their perspective of the story. There's only one perspective. So it's really choose the character that will live this moment and tell you the story. That's, once again, the closest thing you can, uh, closest thing from, uh, for, uh, this, is, this is character selection in literature. Basically. Programming, okay, getting serious. Um, yeah, Ulipo did it. So they, they, did, they did real programming, uh, they made some software, but all of this has been lost uh, because software. But uh, we got some stuff on paper. So this is a flow chart, you probably don't see anything. Um, it's a flowchart about asking your boss for a raise. So like, is the boss at the office? Yes, okay. Knock on the door, does he answer? Yes, 
then go into the office, etc., etc. Look a real flowchart job. I think you will agree to say that flowchart is basically programmation uh, with ifs and elses. So this is made by Georges Pirec, but Georges Pirec went much further, and he took this this flowchart and make a book, a whole book, a short book, but a book out of it called The Art of Asking Your Boss for a Raise. And this book is basically this flowchart in a single sentence. So it's a one sentence book explaining all this in one sentence. I, I don't know if it's the first intention, but I, I like to think that this book is basically the answer to the question, what if programming language didn't exist? What if we, we, we can only program with all language. And this book is the answer, and the answer is, it's terrible. Uh, a common language is probably the worst way to program anything. Uh, but the, the book is also really funny, and it's worth a, worth a read. I don't, I don't think this one has been translated in English, unfortunately, but if you get a chance. So that, that's basically programming in, co programming in common language. Um, coding, yeah? Coding too. They, uh, they uh, Olipo members played around the idea of coding. This is Algol Poem by Noel Arnaud. He wrote several of them. Algol is a programmation language from the 50s, uh, 58, I think. So Noel Arnaud just took the keywords of this language and tried to make poetry with them. So here we go, we got for, go to string, do label, then true array, else value. It's a poem. It, it is. Uh, maybe not the greatest one, but it, it's a poem. And we also have this one. Zero, 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 one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one. I won't read it entirely. Um, this, this was written by Jacques Roubaud. Uh, I wondered if there was a hidden message, message, message in it. I tried to decrypt it on internet, like with binary converters, and yeah, no, only got gibberish. Uh, so I think the, the numbers has ha really have been chosen for their sonority, for the sound. Um, if you want to, you can find on the internet a video of Jacques Roubaud himself reading this poem. Uh, it's, it's really great to, to see. Artificial intelligence. I think you, you're starting to know what's going on. Ulipo did it, or at least uh, they tried. Italo Calvino tried. So Italo Calvino has a project, had a project, sorry. Uh, he wanted to write a mystery novel, a murder novel, like Agatha Christie's like, or Conan Doyle's like, uh, in which the detective would be the computer. So the idea was to give data to a computer, give the, the information, like uh, this guy's dead, the, this one's missing, and have the computer to solve the crime and explain it to us readers, like a detective would do in a mystery novel. Uh, it's, the, the project was not finished. This is uh, one of the early tries, and this is the result given by the computer. So it's not... Great. Uh, it clearly isn't really impressive. Um, and it's not even logical, since, like, baby is supposed to be slaughtered by Arno, then she managed to poison Arno. Yeah, it's not very good. But the, the idea is super great, I think. And I just wanted to include this in the talk because still this idea, do it, do this game, please. Uh, we also have got 360 degrees via panorama. Not good with numbers. And obviously, Ulipo did it. Um, in this, the idea of an attempt of exhausting a place in Paris uh, for this book, Georges Pirec sat on a bench in Paris, uh, Place Saint-Sulpice, and tried to describe, to describe everything he saw. Even the tiniest, tin tiniest, tiniest, smallest details. Uh, especially the smallest details. And the, the idea was to exhaust the place, to say everything that could be said about this place. And uh, he spent three days making this. 
uh, maybe three, not no three, not three whole days, but he went three days in a row on this bench to write. And reading this is basically uh, 300, uh, 360 degrees view. But on paper, you don't even have you don't even have to move the head. Everything is is here. That's that's even greater. Uh, we've got augmented reality games too. Uh, as I said before, Georges Perec wrote, uh, designed several puzzles for magazines, and he especially designed puzzles for, for, in 80, 81, he designed puzzles for the magazine Telerama in France, and puzzles about Paris, and puzzles that needed to be in Paris and to work in Paris in order to solve them, like games where you have to find the shortest way from one point to another, crossword, where you have to be in a certain place in order to solve them. So, street-based puzzle. Um, I like to imagine that people in the 80s were walking in the street of Paris with their, yeah, their magazine like this, like we, we play Pokemon Go now. Not sure it really happened, but that's a nice idea. And then we got train jam. Okay, oh no, no not train jam, that's us, right? That, going on a train, making games, that should be our thing, that's a game developer thing, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you've got uh, on your booklet, you, you, you've got a subway poem explaining what a subway poem is. Uh, so, meta subway poem, maybe. Uh, the idea was, of course, to write poems in the subway, but it was even more complicated than that, since uh, the idea, you, have to, between the, you have to think of the first verse between the first and second station, then write the, second, the first verse at the second station, then think of the second verse between the second and third station, etc., etc. So it's basically a train jam, but shorter, with literature and more constrained. So, yeah, not quite game jam, a train jam, but yeah. So, wait, yeah, what is my point? Uh, my point isn't to say that uh, Ulipo is are the best and they did everything better and they're awesome because, yeah, of course they are. But no, that's not the point. The point is um, to think outside, the, I, I wanted to, 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 to show you what can happen when you think outside the box and especially outside your own medium. Um, because the, um, the Ulipo, the members of the Ulipo were exploring literature. They wanted to push the limits of literature further and further. And what happened is they, found video games, or at least premises of video games. So my advice would be keep pushing. Uh, keep pushing the limits of video games. Don't try to ask yourself what is a game, what isn't. Just explore, keep exploring, and maybe just like the Ulipo prefigured video game with their literature, you'll prefigure the next big thing with your video games, whatever that could be. And that's all, thank you. Maybe. I think we got, we got time for questions. Yeah? I'm not sure if you can hear me, but uh, did Olipo also do Stanford Parable? <laughs> Who? No, no, no. They, they, I, I'm, I'm trying to think maybe of an example. Uh, Stanley Parable. It's like meta literature. I think uh, Nouveau Roman did. It's a later movement in, the, in French literature but not in Ulipo. They were more in the form uh, than in, the, uh, than in yeah, the story or like this. So no, I have no example for you right now. Sorry. Hmm? Meta literature, like the idea of having the medium talking about the, me the medium. That would be, I, I found, that's how I see Stanley Parable. It's a video game talking about itself, about the medium ex itself. And subway poem, yeah. It's a subway poem talking about subway. Yeah, that's what I call, I would call media literature. Yes. Oh yes, yeah. But I, I didn't really pr uh, present it myself. But yeah, I've got a website where I cover small indie free games uh, from Game Jam mostly, and yeah, it's called Ujevipo uh, because Ujevipo would be ouvroir de jeux vidéo potentiel. So yeah. Uh, video game potential, potential video games workshop. That's clearly uh, the inspiration. Yes.
No, no more questions? Okay, well, well thank you. And uh, you, you have, uh, as I told you, you have some stuff to read here to complete uh, the talk. Right. Thank, thank you.